Well, as the candles would show us, it is the second Sunday of Advent. And for us as Christians, this is a time for us to do two things. It is a time for us to look back, and it is a time for us to look forward. We look back and we recognize that God has kept his promise. We look back at a small village called Nazareth, where a young girl is visited by an angel. And that angel tells her that she is going to bear the Messiah, the Savior. We look back at a confused little girl who says, how is this even possible? I have never known man. And that angel tells her that it is the Holy Spirit which will conceive. We look back at a man named Joseph, who now with a wife who was preparing to give birth, is in the city of Bethlehem and can't find a place for his wife to stay. And so, in a manger, she gives birth. But we look back and we realize that there were these shepherds that were in the fields. And all of a sudden, the angel appears and tells them, don't, don't be afraid. I bring tidings of great joy because today in the city of David is born a Savior. We look back and realize that God kept his promise. We also look forward. Because in looking back, we realize that that little boy grew up and he became a man. And he died on the cross. So that you and so that I might have an opportunity for salvation. But in doing that, he also made another promise. He said, I am going away. I go to prepare a place for you. In my father's house of many mansions, if it were not so, I would tell you. And I will return again. And so as we look back, we look forward to the fulfillment of that promise. That although Jesus has left us, he will return Again. And so we look back and we look forward. That's what Advent is all about. It's about us looking back and us looking forward. And in doing that, we do what I am sure many a person in the nation of Israel did before the coming of the Messiah. Many of us ask the question, when will you come back? When will you return, God? And that's what we're going to talk about today in terms of the title of our text. It's all in God's time. That's the answer to the question. God will come back in his time. All in God's time. Our text for today is 2 Peter, 3rd chapter, the 8th through the 15th verse. I am going to be reading from the New King James Version. Let me double check. I'm going to be reading from the New International Version, small print version, which is the reason I have to wear the glasses today, in order to be able to see it. I'd ask that all would please still could please stand in reverence to God's word. Second Peter, third chapter, the eighth through the fifteenth verse. And it reads, But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. He is patient. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar, the elements will be destroyed by fire, and the earth and everything in it will be laid bare. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives. As you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming, that day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire and the elements will melt in the heat. But in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to the new heaven and a new earth, the home of righteousness. So then, dear friends, 
friends, since you are looking forward to this, make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with him. Bear in mind that our Lord's patience means salvation. Just as our dear brother Paul also wrote, you with the wisdom of God given him. May the Lord have a blessing to the reading and hearing of his most holy word. You may be seated. All in God's time. All in God's time. As we look at this Advent season and we look back and we look forward to the fulfillment of his promise, I want to focus on three things today. The first thing is I want to focus on the fact, the fact that God keeps his promises, but he does it in his time. God keeps his promises in his time. The second thing is that none of us know when he will return. And the third thing is that God, his patience, gives as many as possible an opportunity for salvation. God's patience gives as many as possible an opportunity for salvation. So let's look at that first one. God keeps his promises, but he does it in his time. And the Bible supports that 100%. God promised Abraham that he would make him the father of a mighty nation. He promised him a son. And he waited, Abraham waited, Abraham waited, and that son did eventually come, but it came in God's time. When the nation of Israel was taken into slavery in Egypt, God promised, he said, I'm going to bring you out of slavery. But he didn't do it the next day or the next year or the next decade or the next hundred years. It was several hundred years, but God kept his promise. And from the beginning of it all, when the world was broken and fractured by sin, God said, I will fix it. I will send someone to fix it. And over thousands of years, the nation of Israel waited for this coming Messiah. And they waited. And they waited. And they waited. And eventually, God fulfilled his promise in his time. What we have to understand is God will fulfill his promises when the time is right, and the time is right when he is ready. Another way to say that is God will fulfill his promises when he's ready, and when he's ready is the time that is right. But he will fulfill his promises. The, the Bible has showed us that. And so, now we, in the time of the church, we look forward and, we, and God has promised, I will come back. And what we have to stand on, what we have to believe is that he will keep his promise, even though we may not be here to see it. He promised Abraham, I will make you a great nation. Abraham never saw that. He promised the nation of Israel, I will bring you out of slavery. And there are many who never saw that come. He promised the Messiah and Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses. None of them ever saw it. The only thing they had to stand on was their faith and belief that God has made a promise and he will keep it. Now, Jesus may return tomorrow and all of us may get a chance to see that. Glory to God if that is the case. Or he may wait another thousand or two thousand years and none of us may get to see the actual return. Glory to God if that's his choice as well. Just understand that he keeps his promises. He always has. God does not have the ability to not keep his promise. It's, it's not possible. It's not a part of his character and who he is. He doesn't have So we stand in faith as we look forward to his second coming. We stand in faith knowing that he will keep that promise when he is ready. So the next thing that we need to understand is don't waste a whole bunch of time trying to figure out when that will be. All throughout time, for some reason, there have been men and women who have decided that they can figure out exactly when God will return. Now the smart 
Brown said, pick the date that they knew they wouldn't be alive. We've had some that were not so smart that picked a day months away, and then all of a sudden when the second coming doesn't happen, they say, well, you know, I did calculate. I'm a big fan of history, so I love watching our TV shows on the History Channel and American History, although there is a specific section of things that come on the History Channel that kind of annoy me. They, they already show the mystery of the Bible decoding the Bible, the Da Vinci Code, figuring out all of this stuff. And, and the thing is, here's what you have to understand. God did not take the Bible and put some secret code in the Bible that really smart people can figure this code out and figure out exactly when Jesus is going to return. That is not going to happen. And if you believe that is going to happen, then you have to believe that God is dishonest. Because we just read that he will return like a thief. It says no man knows the time, no man knows the hour when he will return. So God would say that to us and then say, but for really smart people, I'm going to put a code in there that they can be code. We do not know when he is going to return. All we know is that he is going to return. And so, when we look at all of these commentators on television, some of them even on Christian television, that say, well, I can look through the Bible, I can look through Ezekiel and Daniel, and he talks about the seven weeks, and I think right now we're in the seventh week, so that means that Jesus' return is imminent. They're absolutely right. Jesus' return is imminent, and it has been imminent since he left. But what does our text say? To God, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like a day. So if he decides to return in seven days, that means we've got 5,000 years to wait. Because it's only been two. But we, we needn't waste time with that. What is it that we should do? And again, the text tells us what we should do as Christians is live each and every day of our lives as if Jesus is going to return today. Live each and every day of our lives as if Jesus is going to return today. What should we do as a body, as First Baptist Church? We should operate within a, this body of Christ known as First Baptist Church as if Jesus is going to return today. And if we live each and every day as if that is the case, we don't have to worry about missing. So what we have to do then is we have to examine ourselves, each and every one of us. We have to look in the mirror, and we have to look at our lives. We have to look at it as we are living our lives now and say, am I living a life that if Jesus returned today and I was standing before him, I could say, I am proud of what I have done. Can we stand before Jesus as a body, as First Baptist Church, and say, you know what, Jesus, yes, we are proud of what we accomplished as a body. We are proud of what we have done in your name. Now, as individuals, we are going to have to, we have to examine ourselves. And don't examine yourself and say, well, I'm not perfect. Because that will be all of us. All of us are imperfect. All of us have had times when we have fallen. All of us have had times when we have done things that we know we shouldn't have. What we are looking for is when we look at the blueprint that Jesus have, has give, given us, are we living our lives according to that blueprint? Are we doing the very best? And when we do fall, are we repenting? Now, as a body, as first Baptists, we have to come together, we have to put our heads together, and we have to be honest. We have to ask some hard questions, and then we have to answer them honestly. Are we as a body doing what God has called us to do? Living each every day as if God were going to return today. That's what the text tells us. Live blameless. Live without shame. Live letting people know the cost and the price. Being peculiar. Peter said, you know what? We're going to be a peculiar people. We are going to be different. We are going to be quite often outside of the mainstream. I got a letter from a fellow pastor, and it was quite a 
disturbing letter. Um, it was from a pastor in Wichita, and he wrote me this letter saying, actually he wrote it to all of the American Baptist pastors in Kansas, saying that uh, he did not feel that he could any longer contribute to the American Baptists. And it all came down to the American Baptist stance on same-sex marriage. And we're going back and forth on this and, 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 and talking about, well, you know that there's, there's certain things that you need to look at. There's the autonomy of the church, and, and, and he hasn't made a decision yet. But the one thing that, although a lot of what he was writing and a lot of his reasoning I could see, I didn't totally do, uh, agree with some of his reasoning. What I did agree with was his, his, his stance in saying that we are not to conform to the culture. The most countercultural and revolutionary entity in the world should be the church. I did agree with that statement. There were other things I did, but I did. And that's exactly where we should be. We, we definitely should be counterculture. We definitely should be revolutionary. When you look at Jesus and you look at the things he said and the things that he did, Jesus was a, considered a radical. Jesus was considered outside of the norm. And that is where we as the church quite often, most of the time, are probably going to end up if we are doing what we are supposed to do. There are things that the world will say are okay that we will not be able to accept. And even with all of this, with us understanding that, hey, we are going to be different. Even with us understanding and believing that God keeps his promises as we wait for the return of the Messiah. Even with us understanding, hey, there's no need asking when it's going to happen, we don't know. There will still be those people, just like the people of ancient Israel, there will be those that ask the question, why are you taking so long, God? My grandmother was one of the most God-loving people that I knew. But I can remember during times of difficulty, uh, during times when she looked at the man that she loved and had been married to for so long and saw that he was a shell of the man that he used to be, when she would look at things that were going on in the world and she would say, why do you tarry, God? Why do you tarry? Now, of course, being a, being a boy born and raised in Detroit, I had no idea what saying. Terry to me was a man. But what she meant was, why are you waiting, God? Why do you take so long? Why haven't you returned? And I asked myself that question. I, I can think back at one time in particular. I had a good friend of mine in high school. His name was Kurt. He was a year ahead of me. Graduated in 1991. Brilliant guy. Really smart guy. And he got accepted to the University of Michigan and Michigan State. And I remember him coming to my dad and asking my dad, well, which one should I go to? Now, my dad's a graduate of the University of Michigan. And so I'm sitting there, and I know what his answer is going to be, right? And he looks at Kurt, he says, you're going to be shocked at my answer, but based on what you're telling me, you want to major in, you should go to Michigan State. I almost fell over in my chair. Right? <laughs> really? Green and white? Dad, did you just say that? Well, Kurt didn't listen, I don't think. If I remember, I think he ended up going to the University of Michigan. And he comes home one, one, uh, one week, and he's, he's at home, and he's in his car, and he's sitting at a stop sign. And a gentleman is running from the police, and in the process of running from the police, he sideswipes Kurt's car, knocking Kurt's car over, and into a tree, and Kurt is killed. And I remember asking my dad after his funeral, I, I don't understand, he said. Why is it that God lets some of these people who are just evil people and they live such long lives, they live in many cases such prosperous lives, yet you have the mother that miscarries, you have the infant that dies, you have people like Kurt who were good people whose lives are ended, why does God do that? And my dad looked at me and said, oh, I don't really have an exact answer for you, but I can tell you what I think, God. I have to tell you. What I think is that because of God's love, because of his grace, because of his mercy, that really evil, bad, nasty person, God wants to give them as many chances as possible to accept 
And so he gives them as many years as he can in order to accept him. Now I look at that and then I look at our text today and what does our text say? Our text says God's patience is salvation. God's patience is salvation. And so I submit to you that part of the reason why God is taking so long is because God loves us so much and God wants so much for us to repent that he's giving us as many chances as possible. He's giving humanity as long as possible to be able to accept him as their Lord and Savior. And if he takes one extra day who knows how many people might be saved because he took an extra day longer. Because what we don't take into consideration as we are in Advent and we look back and we look forward, our picture of, our picture of God is that picture in the rearview mirror. It is a picture of a merciful, a loving, a kind God that loved us so much that he gave his only son so that we might have an opportunity for salvation. And that is a proper picture because that is who God is. But what we don't realize when we're looking forward and we're saying we want God to return is when he returns, he also, while he's still loving, he's still merciful, he's still kind, when he returns, he's returning as judge. And so before he returns as judge, he is trying to give humanity as much of a chance as possible for that person that's being stubborn, that person that, that is, is looking away to be able to say, I accept you. I accept you. And you never know what might happen in a person's life that helps them to accept God's gift. And so we need to understand that, yes, it seems like God's taking his time. But as he takes his time, what he is doing is he is giving as many people as possible an opportunity to be saved. It is God's desire that everyone be saved. That is his desire. And the reason I, I point out desire, I say desire is because I don't want you to think up here think I'm standing up here and saying, with God's sacrifice on the cross, God saved everybody. You will hear that. God did not save everybody. What God did was give everybody an opportunity for salvation, but there's still something that we have to do. We have to accept that gift. And so he waits. And he waits. And he waits. And, I, and thank God, I thank God he waits. And the reason I thank God that he waits is because there are still people in my family that have not accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And when he does return, I want them to be standing right next to me and hearing, well done, good and faithful servant. So as long as he waits and as long as they still breathe, I know they have a chance. And so that is why he waits. And so with that, I want to issue it some charges today. And these charges are not only for you, they are for me as well. And, and the first charge that I'd like to issue to you is just to remember and to stand on faith, knowing that God will keep his promise. He left, he, he promised to send us the Holy Spirit and he did. And he told us, I will return again. So don't worry about men, but just stand on the faith and belief that God will return because he keeps his promises. And so if you will do that, if you are going to accept that charge, that God will return and you will just stand on faith believing that, just say, I will. Amen. Second charge. Don't waste time trying to figure out when. Don't, because here's the thing. And, and part of my personality is that I'm not often blunt, but sometimes I just feel you just need to be blunt. And to be blunt is none of your business. It's none of your business when God is going to return. <coughs> it's God's business. So I charge you, don't spend a whole lot of time trying to figure out 
when it will be. But here's the important part of the charge. Live your life each and every day like he's going to return that day. Live your life each and every day showing people the light of Christ which is within you. Showing people the Holy Spirit. Live your life each and every day trying to show someone who has turned from Jesus or who does not know him who he is. That there is a God in heaven that still sits on the throne and still is in control of all of this. Live your life like that each and every day. Don't worry about when the return will happen. It will in God's time. But live your life in a way that will be pleasing to Christ. If you will accept that charge, say, I will. Amen. You have said it. And there is a third charge. And this third one, many of you have probably it's a two part. First part is that if God is placing something on your heart, something that you are called to do, something that you are called to pray for, don't ignore it, do it. Don't say to God, it doesn't make sense, God, because it probably doesn't make sense to you. God knows what he's doing. So I, I charge you to listen to the Holy Spirit that is within you and do what God is telling you to do. And finally, if you have not accepted Jesus Christ, or if you have turned away from Jesus Christ, or if you have backslidden, I charge you And I give you this charge with every ounce of sincerity within my heart because the fact of the matter is, even if God waits 2,000 years to return, you don't have 2,000 years. And none of us knows how long we have. Some of us have 90 years, some of us have 30, some of us have 50, we don't know. But as long as you are taking breath into your lungs, you can still make that choice. And I implore you, I charge you, if you do not know Christ, please take this opportunity to accept him. We're now going to open the altar for prayer, and I'm going to extend an invitation to you to accept Christ. And most of all, again, most importantly, this is all about accepting Christ. Once you do that, we can figure out what comes after that. We can figure out if First Baptist Church is the place that you should be, or we can figure out if maybe you should plant your seed at another church. Most of all, importantly, to accept on Mary's lap and sleep in whom angels greet. Anthem sweet while shepherds walk.